Thank you very much, Ben. Um, this is the last day. Thank you very much, everybody, for showing up. Um, can I say before we start that this is my favorite meeting, scientific meeting premise, and uh, uh, this, uh, this year's edition was no exception. I think it's been uh, a pleasure. It's been so well organized, and it's been a very stimulating conference. So can we have just a hand for the organizing committee? Thank you. Okay, so actually I'll go back. Uh, I definitely want to acknowledge, as Ben was saying, the support of the uh, CIHR's Institute for uh, Gender and Health and the Quebec IRSST. That is also a, a big support to this chair program, to, to my chair. So uh, thank you to those uh, supporting agencies. Uh, so the outline of my talk today, let me start the timer here. Um, so uh, I'm going to address a few topics and then you can see at the bottom here in the slide where I am in, in the presentation. So I'm going to start talking about terminology and uh, I know it's a, it's a loaded issue. I'm going to just present how I situate myself uh, in terms of the ter terminology sex, gender, SG, SRG, S plus G. Uh, so I'll talk about these issues. Um, and then I'll talk about why it, it is important, why could it be important to talk about sex gender issues in musculoskeletal health or MSD uh, research. Uh, and then I'll switch to a scientific literature based uh, model, so theoretical model that I've been sort of working on as uh, one of, of my life's work so far at least. Um, and that started from the literature, the scientific literature. So I'll start first by talking about the literature that led to this model uh, at, at this step, and then I'll follow up with my studies that have uh, added or that have helped me to build up the complexity of that uh, theoretical model. I'll finish with some words of caution. Um, so, uh, so where I think this research could or should or maybe should not go. Uh, so I'll give my opinion on that and then general recommendations. So sex or gender. Uh, so I'll start by the classical definitions. Uh, I think everybody would be comfortable with these definitions. They're well published, well uh, cited. So sex, when we talk about sex, we refer to the biological determination of what it is to be a male or a female. Uh, whereas when we talk about gender, we talk about the socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities. And I think what's important is that part there that a given society considers appropriate for men and women. I think we have, we're, we're all parts of different societies here and uh, this is one snapshot in, in, in life and then we could uh, imagine the societies 50 years ago or 100 years in the future and that they might actually affect uh, our con construct of gender or our, our understanding of gender. So I think it's important to refer to the, uh, the, to the, 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 the given society when we talk about gender. So uh, those, that was the easy slides with the definition. Now the complicated slides. So sex or gender, it's complicated. That's my opinion at least. And that's what I've come to conclude and that's fine. I live very well with this complication. That's fine. Um, so why is it complicated? Uh, we uh, were part, I was part of a, a very nice paper published in 2014 uh, with some colleagues, uh, I think maybe some in the room. Uh, where uh, there was a discussion on the uh, interaction and the influence of sex on gender and vice versa. So even though sex and gender have nice distinctive definitions, uh, there is a significant interaction between them. So the use is going to be affecting the biology and the biology definitely affects use. Uh, so, so there is definitely some level of interaction between uh, these concepts. And to reflect this, uh, this is one of the reasons why sometimes you'll see on some slides SG, when we talk about a, a concept that we're not sure exactly if it's purely biolog biological or purely gender. And let's face it, this could be said for a lot of aspects where we're not exactly sure if we're talking biology or uh, soci sociology or psychosocial aspects. And an additional point that I've been adding in the last year while talking about sex and gender in Italy, in Denmark, so in, in places where English is not necessarily the first language, I came to realize that there is not necessarily that, uh, that level of um, complexity in terminology in some languages. Um, so I see some people nodding. Uh, when, when I would spend time to actually address this terminology in some classrooms in Italy and Denmark, people just didn't know what the problem was. They would use gender, sex is for something else. So thank you very much to my colleagues for alluding me to this. 
sometimes, uh, sometimes it's a non-issue. But I think it, it's worth it to acknowledge that it, it is an issue in the English language, and actually that issue can help us in our research to help us distinguish biology and the uh, psychosocial aspects. So are men and women different? Uh, yes, to some extent. It's difficult to argue otherwise. And, uh, but I wanted to give you two snapshots, so two uh, images that I've been taking uh, from the many, many images uh, circulating around, really showing, yes, some level of difference, but definitely some level of overlap. Okay, so uh, here we, we can talk about really any construct. Uh, this, this is just one example here of H-rate H-rate or A-score. And uh, on the right-hand side, this is an example of uh, body size or, or how tall so somebody is. So there is definitely a clear bimodal distribution in most of these aspects, but there is a clear overlap as well. So I think it's important to recognize that. So when we talk about a sex-gender difference, exactly what does it mean? It means that when we look at the average male and the average female, these two average individuals, which don't exist, their um, results of, of statistical models, they are different statistically. So that's what we mean when we talk about a sex-gender difference. But, uh, of course, it's much more complicated than that. And again, I refer to this gray area here of overlap. So not, it's very important to know that not every man is different from every woman. And, and it's important to remind ourselves of that because that has consequences on how we could take these uh, results and uh, conclusions. And sex gender, uh, sex gender differences, what more information can we extract? So there's one question. Are we different or not different? That's one question, but there are other questions that we could be asking. So how big is this average difference? And how big is the overlap? That's already two questions rather than one that are quite important, I would argue, in the MSD research. And then one step beyond how much of it is cultural, how much of it is truly genetic, and how are these differences changing? That's another whole complexity to the issue. So what I wanted to do with these slides is just really to, uh, to take a simple question that we all know is not that simple, but to highlight some reasons why it's not that simple and why it matters to us in MSD research. So three examples again of, uh, I picked three, or actually I found three uh, topics or three um, uh, constructs that could be relevant to MSD research um, or to biology and the sex and gender differences. And you can clearly see that, uh, for example, there's one extreme here. Uh, I can't really uh, read too well, but I'm pretty sure it's a biological construct, uh, construct uh, where there's not at all any overlap. Okay, so for some aspects of biology, when we try to compare men and women, there will be no overlap, basically, or, or very, very negligible. For some constructs, there will be significant overlap. Okay, so connectivity between brain regions. This is one area where um, it's, it's difficult to actually find a gender difference in the literature on, on that. Uh, although uh, I did find some gender differences on that, but um, so there are some aspects of biology where uh, a man and a woman are not that different. And then there's the one in the middle, there's heights, okay, where some are different, some are similar, and there's a, a large gray area. So the point here is that we need to talk about or we need to look at a, a lot of different constructs to be able to, con to make a complete model, in our case, of musculoskeletal disorders. And the different constructs are going to be either similar or either, either different between, uh, between sex and genders. And uh, if I sum that up in one question that's been guiding a lot of what I do, Really, the question that we want to be asking ourselves is for the most salient elements of the MSD injury mechanisms, what is the evidence that there are sex gender differences? That's really the main question we want to be asking ourselves in order to consider sex gender appropriately in MSD research. So some evidence here uh, of uh, clear sex gender differences, at least in statistics, uh, this is not uh, my uh, research area too much, but what I, what I did is I, I tried to find what people agree on in terms of, uh, of, of gender differences in health. Uh, so there is this, this slide here that, uh, that um, lists different uh, health problems. 
Uh, so, and then you see the difference between the prevalence rate in men on the left and uh, in women on the right. So, for example, diseases of the ears, uh, diseases of the re respiratory system, and uh, diseases of the musculoskeletal system. So, according to these statistics and most of the statistics that we know, uh, there is a higher rates in women. But that's not the case for all diseases necessarily. Okay, so uh, I just wanted uh, to point out that this question is asked in, in health research at, at large, and we don't necessarily come to the same conclusion depending on the, the kind of, of health problem. So the uh, American NIH has started to, to look into this and to circulate uh, uh, a discussion on uh, what is the evidence out there for uh, sex or for gender. Uh, in, some, uh, in some disorders. So here, uh, I just thought it was a nice chart to point to our colleagues uh, in, in, in NIH and the, the kind of work that they do, uh, the kind of information that they, that they disseminate. And uh, here this is a slide pointing at different body regions, talking about uh, diseases or health problems in these regions, and explaining what could be the sex or the biological basis for the, for the, the, the disease and what could be the, the gender basis. So uh, again, uh, nice, nice work here. Two slides on statistics just to uh, agree on the starting points, okay? That's in our world in MSD research, in, in uh, work-related musculoskeletal disorders, um, most of the statistics agree, at least in questionnaires and interviews, that uh, the, the, the prevalence rate is higher in women. So this is a slide, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stock. Uh, I, I uh, borrowed this slide from her presentation yesterday. Uh, so gender differences in work absence, duration, and proportion of prolonged absences. Uh, this is taken from the uh, Quebec ECHO test survey. And the numbers do show some, uh, some differences where uh, the mean duration is longer uh, in women. Uh, the percent of absence of longer than 90 days is uh, higher in women. And the proportion of study sample meeting the case definition is higher already uh, in women. So uh, most of the statistics would agree on that. And if we switch to another region of the world that is also very interested in, in this kind of research, uh, so uh, again, thank you to, uh, to these colleagues for, for this fine work. And they looked at 49,000 Danish workers. So a very long, comprehensive study here. And, uh, but the results are about the same, I would say. So they're very similar where uh, the, uh, the, the number of complaints uh, actually, or the, the percent of complaints and the, um, uh, the ratios, uh, the uh, odds ratios for reporting an MSD are higher in women. So uh, whether in Quebec, whether in Denmark, uh, all around the world, there seems to be this, this uh, gender difference in MSD reporting or self-reporting. So given that, given that uh, in MSDs, uh, it seems to be the case that women uh, report more uh, musculoskeletal disorders, and uh, my research pertains mostly to the upper limbs, uh, what is the evidence out there that the, obs the observation that these kinds of MSDs uh, occur most uh, often in women is sex-based or gender-based? So the purely sex based, I really tried to pick the most biological arguments that I could find. So arguments in favor of sex based mechanisms to underlie the uh, statistics of more MSDs in women, hormonal levels. Okay, so uh, it, it, it turns out that, that, that the literature does show that that could be an important part of the explanation, uh, just the hormonal uh, difference between men and women, could uh, somehow, I'm, I'm postulating that the rationale is that that could be a part of the mechanism for uh, muscle injury repair mechanisms, although uh, there could be arguments to say that hormones could come into play in other parts of the mechanism. And then, if you think of something, okay, most likely biological, muscle mass and fiber content, yes, that's definitely a big difference between men and women, and I'll be talking about that uh, uh, at length in next slides. But then we start to, uh, to, to touch on the territory of maybe use, okay? So fiber content, I think we have to be careful there. But I, I pick these two examples, hormonal levels and muscle mass, as most likely biologically based uh, differences between men and women that could be part of the explanation for uh, more MSDs in, in women. Uh, but there definitely is an argument in favor of gender-based mechanisms. 
Uh, so especially here for upper extremity MSDs, and again I remind you this is the, the main object of my research, uh, there is this uh, belief, and I, I cannot argue against it, and I, I agree that it's probably a, a big part of the explanation, that the difference is really uh, related to use, to the kind of work that men and women do. So work-related uh, upper extremity disorders are frequent in static load and monotonous and repetitive work, not only in these occupations, but by, uh, mostly or in large part in these occupations. And it happens that these occupations are mostly held by women. So uh, it's not the only reason that I could think of for the gender difference. There are others that I'll talk about, but I just pick these examples as uh, an argument in favor of sex mechanism, an argument in favor of gender mechanisms. Uh, we've been talking about carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, so I just wanted to address, uh, to address or pick one example uh, of one type of MSD, work-related MSD. I'm not a carpal tunnel syndrome expert, but I usually, I, I often use this as a model to really explain uh, the, the, the strength of the arguments in favor of both sex and gender to explain the much higher rates of carpal tunnel uh, in women. Uh, so there was a report in NIH, and I'm quoting the report uh, in 2009, that states really uh, word by word that women are three times more likely than men to develop carpal tunnel syndrome, and they go as far as to say that it's perhaps because the carpal tunnel itself the structure of the carpal tunnel may be smaller in women than in men. So that was an NIH position. But when you look at other studies, uh, when analysis was separated by gender, there are different factors in men and in women that could relate to carpal tunnel. So women, biggest risk factor is the number of pregnancies. That's purely biological, I would, I would argue. And men, biggest risk factor is for forceful work exposure. So that actually speaks to the importance of considering mechanisms for men and for women, because the mechanisms could be quite different between the two. Okay, so this is leading me to, uh, to a leap of faith, or, or the starting points of, of a research program, to really understand the pathophysiological uh, basis uh, for the higher prevalence of neck shoulder MSDs in women. So uh, I have to thank or curse Karen Messing for that. I, I never know which one uh, I should use. Uh, but but I, I came across some research findings, and I'll talk about that later, that really started a, a line of questioning or a line of doubt. And I think doubt is not a bad thing in research. But really, uh, this, this was a starting point of uh, someone actually asking me, uh, a reviewer in a paper uh, asking me, to create a theoretical model, uh, a conceptual model such as this one, to uh, try to explain why it is that women have more uh, neck shoulder MSDs. So the next slides I'm going to talk about the literature, the literature, the scientific literature that is the basis for this model. So uh, I highlighted the, the little boxes in the upper right there. So, um, so for each, uh, I highlighted actually three boxes that uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present most of the literature, scientific literature, uh, to support the importance of these three. So muscle mass, the type of muscle fiber, and related to that, fatigue or endurance, and pain threshold. So those are three elements that uh, have been sort of accepted in my uh, proposition of a theoretical model, so I'll present the research on those three topics. Muscle mass and strength. We know, uh, and it's pretty uh, clear, uh, that there are well-known sex gender differences in strength. Uh, shoulder, definitely, if we talk about neck shoulder disorders, uh, all the statistics, all the um, uh, studies show that men are much stronger with their shoulders, uh, neck to some, to some extent as well. Um, but in everyday life, maybe women consistently work at intensities closer to their maximum. So that could be the link between a difference in strength and why that difference in strength could put women at, at, at greater risk of neck shoulder MSDs. And the other argument for this is that there are well-known benefits of strength training on injury prevention. So that to me says that strength could be a plausible part of the model to separate uh, to, to explain why uh, females uh, have more neck shoulder MSDs. Um, and there's an effect of age as well on that. I, I just wanted to mention this, uh, although I'm not really talking about age in this presentation, but 
there is definitely a, a difference uh, between males and females, and that difference seems to increase uh, with, with age, basically. Um, so, uh, so it is something that's, uh, that, that, that I think is a plausible part of the explanation. Um, okay, uh, muscle fiber composition. So uh, relating to the proportion of muscle fibers, uh, it's well known that women have a higher percent, per percentage of type 1 fibers in their muscles, not to the same extent in every muscle, but as far as I could see in the literature in most muscles, and, and it's, a clear, it's a clear difference. Um, it sounds like a good thing maybe that women have more uh, uh, muscle fibers that are the endurant ones, but there is a theory out there to say that these endurance muscle fibers are also vulnerable to uh, some kinds of uh, low load repetitive work injuries. And those are the kinds of injuries that we see in the neck and shoulder in women. In terms of, uh, um, of um, proportion of uh, muscle fibers, so muscle fiber percentages, I just found this recent study, which I think also is, is, an, is a nice illustration of how structure can maybe theoretically affect function. So this is a cross-sectional area of the uh, lower leg, and in the upper parts you see the gastrocnemius and the soleus muscle, and in the lower part you see the tibialis anterior. And you see, if you look at gastrocnemius and soleus, the proportion of uh, muscle fibers in, in these two muscles are, are quite different for men and women. Okay, so this is type 2A muscle fibers, I believe, but the percentages of the three muscles for males on the left compared to females is quite different. Okay, and that could affect many things. One example, one of the things that this could affect is function and coordination. Okay. Um, so, yes, and, and that is in line with some of the results that we see that men and women don't move the same way, don't use their bodies the same way, and this could be a biological basis for this, the, uh, the between muscle differences in the uh, muscle fibers. Talking about muscle fibers and the, the, the fact that women have more type 1 muscle fibers, I wanted to mention the, the research on muscle fatigue. And there are not that many uh, research programs or really strong researchers in, in the biological basis of MSDs uh, that, that really care about uh, sex gender differences, but I wanted to highlight the, uh, the work of Sandra Hunter, who's done a lot of work uh, in specifically on fatigue and uh, sex gender differences. So this is her uh, 2014 review paper that presents a model for why uh, women are less fatigable. Right away, I think that statement is quite controversial. It really depends on the context. It really depends on the load. But let's start with cases or situations where women are less fatigable. And the way that Sandra Hunter explains this is that uh, this is a multi-level uh, uh, model or mechanism. Whereas there is a difference in muscle fiber, we know that. There is, there is a difference in muscle, uh, muscle mass. But the central nervous system could also play a part in this, as we know that the central nervous system is involved in fatigue. So there, there, there would be differences in sympathetic activity and thereby in motor neuron activation. Okay, so, uh, so that sort of is a nice conceptual model, I think, of sex gender differences in fatigue. And of course, we all know that fatigue is an important risk factor for MSDs. So, uh, I had this, uh, this interesting discussion with my dinner uh, colleagues yesterday, and I was talking about, uh, about this. Uh, in researching the latest, uh, the, the, the latest kind of hot findings on uh, sex differences uh, that could have something to do with MSDs, I came across this study, lo and behold, from my colleague in McGill. Uh, so uh, the starting point here, and I'm highlighting the, the, the section of the, the conceptual model here, so where um, the research really shows that there is a difference between men and women in pain thresholds. That is repeated in many studies, that is, uh, that is very constant. And what that research shows is that women feel more pain intensity. They feel the pain sooner with a lower threshold or with a lower stimulus. They'll report pain quicker. And they feel the pain longer. So they feel the pain uh, for a longer duration. Okay, so pain, you'll tell me, Julie, well, we know pain 
is biology based, but it has to be psychosocially based as well because it's a feeling, it's an, it, sometimes it's an emotion. And I cannot argue against that, but there is strong evidence for the biological basis of pain. And that's where I refer to my colleague, Jeff Mogul in, in McGill University that has identified two different proteins that are involved in the pain mechanisms of males and the pain mechanisms in females. And the kind of cool and interesting information is that the two different proteins, the, when, it does, when the women's or the female protein doesn't work well, it's usually associated with someone with red hair. Somehow there's a genetic connection there. So I'm looking for red hairs. Uh, so if you feel more pain, it's, it's legitimate. Don't, don't be shy to, to say it. So, um, so this tells me that there is an important biological basis to the, uh, to the, the sex difference in, the, in pain experience. And that's the paper there that just came out well, last year in the Nature Neuroscience. Uh, one last uh, observation uh, that I just made recently, again, in trying to scope really what is known and what is shown in the literature, the overall scientific literature, that again could be related to sex differences, sex gender differences in MSDs. Some, that idea that the, uh, the, the, the connectivity patterns could be different between men and women. I looked closely at that research, and I can refer you, the, the reference is, is at the bottom there, and uh, um, I, I'm not a specialist in, in brain mapping, and uh, I, I think it's something, it's worth looking at it very closely, but the, just to say that there is a body of literature here uh, or there uh, looking at the different connectivity patterns in the brains between men and women. Okay, so, and, and I think that pretty much sums up the, any kind of biological basis uh, that I could see uh, in the literature to ground the model that I'm trying to build now with experimental studies. So the next step, where to go from here? What can I do to add to this, uh, to this body of, of knowledge and understanding to explain this uh, sex gender difference in, uh, in MSDs? Uh, is to build up on the, uh, on, on the model. So as you notice, I've added some boxes. It's gonna be too big soon for, for one screen. But I think it's really a nice roadmap to situate myself and to organize the progression of my research. So I, I would highly recommend uh, this way to, or to, to sort of map out the research. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna talk about the research uh, projects that we do in my lab that try to answer some of these questions that are left unanswered by the uh, theoretical model. Okay, I think we can uh, shut down the noise. This was an experiment. This is the first time that I show a video of the, uh, of the uh, experimental task that we do in my lab. Uh, we're driving our uh, lab neighbors nuts with, uh, with all this beeping around. Um, but, but this is really the experimental task that we've been presenting in, in many of the papers. And, and what we did there, we tried to think of an experimental lab-based task so albeit, and, and I acknowledge this is a lab-based task. Um, so we tried to find an experimental task that could somehow reproduce what could be uh, a functional risk or a task that could be risky, that could pose a risk to develop neck shoulder MSD. Of course, when performed for a very long amount of time. So for the ergonomists out there, I'm sure you just cringed when you saw a repetitive task at shoulder heights. Right, so that's a no-no basically in, in, uh, in the uh, ergonomy world. And uh, so we, that's what we picked. We decided to pick a task that would necessarily fatigue the neck shoulder region, so that was the goal. And this is a repetitive pointing task following a beat of a metronome, uh, one movement per second. So as you see, it is pretty constrained, but it also allows for some room, some adaptation, some differences in how people might accomplish the task. And that was the goal, to see if these, uh, this, this freedom, this, this, uh, this possibility to do the task differently was taken advantage of differently by men versus women. So the subjects uh, were to continue this task until they uh, rated eight on the Borg CR10 scale. And of course the participants don't know this, that this is a termination criteria. And now it disqualifies all of you from being participants because you all know that that's how we would end the task. 
Uh, so again, the original intent was to reproduce a common uh, uh, fatiguing uh, upper limb task. And uh, so far, because we've been repeating this protocol uh, with many students uh, for some years, now we've collected about 60 men, or data for 60 men and 60 women, which, which is actually a lot in, in my uh, experimental world. So this is the uh, task from the different point of view. So it, when you see the task, you can imagine what could be some compensations or some ways to accomplish the task. You can notice here there is an obstacle right under the elbow travel, again, to force people to really do this task at shoulder heights. Okay, but you can, you can sort of imagine or even visualize some of the different ways that, that someone could actually accomplish the task. So what are we recording? Uh, we've been uh, trying to be diligent and record uh, at least the, the, the three or the four common measurements here. So uh, bipolar surface EMG uh, across uh, the trunk, the neck, and the upper limb. Whole body kinematics, uh, trying to track how the body moves during this task. And we can also track the whole body center of mass. Uh, center pressure trajectories, so the subjects are standing on force plates. So we can also track their postural sway and heart rate to get some kind of measure of the change in the, uh, in the cardiovascular system. Before and after the task, so for these measurements, uh, for EMG, kinematics, uh, center pressure, and heart rate, we collect data every minute. So we can really track how these measurements are changing. And for the other measurements, uh, so force, uh, proprioception, I'll talk about how we measure that, pressure pain threshold, sensory detection threshold, and blood flow, we collect measurements before and after the task. So for the next slides, when I talk about fatigue effects, I mean what happens as they, uh, uh, before and after they complete this repetitive task. So that's what I mean by fatigue. It, that's how we fatigue the participants. So let's go to results. So uh, time to task termination, how quickly or how, uh, when did men and women report a Borg of eight? Or when did they report fatigue? Well, first surprising result, there was actually no uh, sex gender difference. Uh, all the subjects without a, a clear main sex gender effect reported uh, a Borg of eight about, uh, after about 10 minutes. So even without load, it's a very fatiguing task. Okay, so just by holding the, the weight of the arm. We measured pre and post RPT, so this is a repetitive pointing task, maximum shoulder and elbow force. And not surprisingly, men's force is higher. Uh, for all muscles, it's the case before and after fatigue, except for the upper trapezius. And this was the starting point of all the surprises that I was gonna find and all the uh, questions that I was gonna try to answer to explain this. So again, thanks to the reviewers, I didn't even think about comparing men and women in that paper, and someone asked me to do that, and I uh, found this, this uh, observation that for shoulder elevation post-fatigue, there was no gender difference, meaning that it looks like the task was more fatiguing for men. So what happens with the movement? So as the participants move uh, or accomplish this task with their finger, Another very surprising finding, I think I'm starting with my, my, my two uh, favorite findings because they were not what I expected. With fatigue, the average finger range of motion and velocity of men is higher, meaning that with fatigue, men do things quicker. And the opposite finding was found in women. With fatigue, women would shorten their movements and would move slower. So this is the, uh, the curves here. So in the bottom left, you see this is the, uh, is it the velocity, I think. Uh, yeah, so I think it's the velocity. I can't really see too well. But you can see uh, that uh, women, it decreased with fatigue, and men, it increased with fatigue. And uh, the same thing with the range of motion. Although there was not too much room to modify range of motion on the finger, there was still a little bit of, of possibility to change the trajectory. So how did they do that with their bodies? So uh, in the previous slide, I was looking at what the finger does, but now how does the body cope? How does the body adjust? And uh, this is brand new findings of two weeks ago, and that's what we're able to do now with looking back at all the data that we've collected on the same task. 
And uh, what we found is that there was actually a, a time by gender effect on the anterior posterior right shoulder position. And uh, these are really uh, technical terms, but I'll, I'll summarize by saying that uh, men, similarly to the previous slide, men seem to find more ways to change their pattern, their overall pattern with the shoulder, with the whole body center of mass. So there were just more kinematic adaptations for men's patterns with fatigue. Um, so uh, the one uh, graph at the bottom here is the, uh, is the whole body center of mass. Of course, the men's body center of mass is going to be higher, that's a given, but only the men showed some way to change its position by leaning sideways, by elevating uh, their joints. So again, most of the kinematic components, only men found a way to change their patterns with fatigue. Leading to the concept of motor variability, we've had a couple of uh, sessions here in this, uh, in this meeting about motor variability. And uh, I'll just quickly define what is motor variability. It's the intra-individual variations of motor outcomes from one trial to the next. In other words, how repeatable are we? And there seems to be quite unanimous, except maybe for one recent finding uh, from our lab, but by and large, it seems that uh, women show less variability. Women are much more repeatable in how they perform the task. Uh, in the words of my colleague Matthiessen, Women are better repeaters than replacers. Okay, is it good? Is it bad? I don't know, in terms of injury risk. So again, low variability could be good or bad if we think that it might impose a continuous repetitive load on the same muscles. Okay, so, and in fact, low variability has been shown uh, with experimental data to be a predictor of injury development. So sex, gender, uh, fatigue, and motor variability. Uh, what happens with fatigue? Are men and women able to change or to take advantage of this motor variability? Well, it seems that, again, yes, but only men. Men increase their upper trapezius variability with fatigue. This is uh, one of the results that we've shown. Um, there is slightly, uh, a slight difference in finding for the biceps for our experimental task. Remember, again, the type of task that we studied. But the biceps is not as much the muscle that we were targeting with fatigue. So if we look at really the muscles that are targeted for fatigue, those muscles that are getting fatigue, men are more able to modify or vary their patterns as fatigue develops. And even more importantly, when we look at initial variability, so maybe a hypothesis would be okay. So if we're more variable, we'll have more endurance, right? That is the case, but again, only in men. So initially high shoulder EMG variability is a predictor of endurance, sorry, but only in women, suggesting that it is an important component that could be worked on to the advantage of women. If we were able to create more variability for women, uh, if we were able to create more variability, it would help women especially. So I'll go uh, very quickly on this. I could talk about methods and equations, and, uh, but I, I really don't think it's the point. But so far we've talked about joints or kinematics in movements. We've talked about muscles, individual muscle behavior. And if we talk about how muscles work together, so this is a functional connectivity of muscles, which is a measure of how, I'll say it very crudely, uh, of how, muscle, how closely a pair of muscle is in tune. How do they uh, work together? So uh, no connectivity is zero, and uh, complete connectivity is one. So first studies, or the, the, uh, the, the, the early studies looking at uh, intermuscle connectivity in the trapezius region between males and females showed that connectivity was much higher in females. Females communicate more. That's always how I sort of explain it. To, to the audience, nobody's surprised by that, but their muscles also seem to be communicating more. Uh, should we be proud of that? I don't know. In this case, it's not clear is if actually this is a good idea to prevent injury, and I could argue that it's not a good idea to prevent injury, okay? Whereas this could be a way to spread fatigue more quickly over neighboring muscles. Um, I would say, though, that this is a, a quite preliminary line of research, and I think a lot of research needs to be done now to, uh, to get a better sense of that. 
And uh, one other reason why it's important, I think, to develop more research on those uh, muscle metrics is that in, in the study that we did on the repetitive pointing, uh, we somehow saw an opposite finding where initially there was more connectivity in men. But again, men were much more flexible in changing their patterns with fatigue. So men decrease their connectivity a lot more with fatigue. So again, this idea that men somehow, for some reason, I have ideas about why, but uh, I won't go too far for now, but somehow the idea that the men's motor system is more flexible, more adaptable, at least for the kinds of tasks that we studied. Very quickly on uh, sex and gender and proprioception. So I think this will be the last set of uh, experimental findings before uh, I go to some, some more general recommendations. Um, again, um, well, not again, because it was not part of the first model, but studies uh, are accumulating to show that men or, or women have better proprioception. Women have better position sense, and uh, this, this is usually the case for most of, of uh, the, the data that we see in literature and in our lab. Shoulder position sense, so you can see uh, the uh, right uh, graph where we have men and women's errors in reproducing a shoulder flexion angle and shoulder force sense where women are asked to match a certain level of force. In both cases, there's a main sex gender effect, women are more accurate. But again, is this a good thing or a bad thing? I think accuracy has benefits, definitely. Um, so, uh, but maybe for uh, production of, of uh, injuries, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, so, uh, also in terms of proprioception, what we observed, which was quite interesting, is that we asked women and men to place their finger to a virtual position that was 50% of arm length and shoulder height. Okay, so in this case, we were interested in looking at the position of the finger. In this particular case, we did not see a sex gender difference in the error itself, but we saw a big difference in the actual place where men and women thought their 50% and their shoulder height was. Women thought that it was closer to them and lower, so when they were asked to go to their 50%, they went here. And men, when they were asked to go to their 50% shoulder height, they went here. So there seems to be a difference in some kind of mapping of, of what we have of ourselves in terms of our position in space. Could that be important? Uh, I, maybe, if, if we don't, uh, perceive uh, the, the, the same, um, that could have an effect on w the difficulty of working in a certain space that, that, we, uh, that we perceive. So the last finding, sex, gender, and pain, uh, I've covered the literature on that. Uh, on this slide here, I did not uh, show anything more other than, again, confirming that pain thresholds are lower in women. Women report pain at a lower stimulus intensity. So this is a paradigm here that, that a lot of us use with the pressure algometer. So uh, you press, you apply a pressure stimulus, the patient has a button, and you increase gradually the pressure stimulus the patient or the subject presses the button when they feel some pain, and women push the button much earlier than men, and that's constant. But we tried uh, to answer the question, and actually three years ago, again, uh, it was in this meeting three years ago that someone said, okay, so how do you know if it's actually a pain mechanism or if it's a sensory detection mechanism? How do we know if it's central or if it's peripheral? So went back to the lab, tried to answer this question, and what we did is we added a protocol. Uh, some of you might know this is quantitative sensory testing where we apply a very light stimulus of increasing thickness on a muscle surface, and we measure the threshold when men and women perceive anything, something, putting pain aside, okay? And we didn't find any difference there. So this is the, uh, the results here. So we have a pressure pain threshold, but also a sensory threshold. And there didn't seem to be really a relationship between uh, the pressure pain threshold and the sensory threshold here, suggesting that it's, it's probably a pain mechanism, not necessarily or a central mechanism of pain interpretation rather than a uh, peripheral mechanism. So this is one study, actually, where we had a hypothesis that would have worked beautifully in the model, 
didn't turn out to be true, and that's okay. I think we need to be open to that and to new possibilities and building up a theoretical model. So uh, that's the model now, and I put one box aside because the box of sensory detec detection threshold, I was not able or not, I was not comfortable relating it to the mechanism for why there would be a higher prevalence of neck shoulder MSDs um, in women. So I think that's, that's where we are in terms of building the model. So a, a few uh, concluding words I'm going to try. They're important words, though, so I want to take a few minutes to, to talk about these things. Um, so I, I confess I'm a biomechanist. I'm a biomedical engineer. And a lot of what is missing from that model, and that's okay, but it is missing, is uh, most of the gender-related aspects. Okay, so... Um, of course, sex pain are two constructs that have biological but also psychosocial basis. Um, and one big aspect is that when we talk about fatigue or pain, do we? Do the men and women really understand the same thing when someone says, I'm fatigued or I'm, I'm in pain? Um, I'm not sure. Even if we try to find a, a, a common score of a fatigue rating of eight, does eight mean the same thing for men or for women? So I think that's the next step, and I've had conversations with colleagues, and I think that's an important uh, issue to study. Of course, what is missing in all of this, and uh, probably one of the very important pieces, is uh, job exposure or job assignments. We know that that is a big part, uh, and most likely, again, the important part, but what if biology had a part to play in it? I think it's worth studying. But again, uh, of course, job assignments is important. Family roles, career choices, work-life balance, I'm just highlighting some very crucial, important uh, gender aspects that, that distinguish men for women. And uh, exercise and behavioral habits. So far, we talk about work-relevant aspects or personal aspects, but what about the impact of what people, what workers do outside of work? And there is a big gender difference there as well. And I'll refer to the Holterman group here who um, I think a few years ago at this meeting again, was th they were talking about the importance of enjoying and leisure time, physical activity. It happens that there is a big difference in genders between the leisure time, physical activity, women exercise much less. Okay? So I, I think that's an important part of the model as well. A, a, a couple of slides on the methodolo methodological issues in data collection. Um, I just picked one example of data that we collect and how that one example could be affected by our preconceived ideas of, of men and women. If I pick the one example of EMG, let's say we do a study with surface EMG trying to compare men and women. Well, we base our electrode placement on some anatomical assumptions. Should they be the same for men and women? I'm not sure. Um, uh, in terms of noise, in terms of uh, superficial fat, in terms of biolo biological tissue between where we measure and what we're trying to measure, could there be a sex difference there? So those are important things to keep in mind uh, in, in terms of limitations of our measurements. Uh, the issue of EMG normalization, I didn't really report any results on normalization, so and I know that some colleagues in Brazil are doing important work on that, but when we talk about reference contraction or maximal voluntary contractions, how do we know that the maximal is, is the same proportionally for men and women when we do these kinds of experiments, when we try to get at maximal voluntary contractions? That could be another source of... I wouldn't say it error, but difference, inherent difference. And we have the, uh, the um, panel discussion right after this keynote, so uh, I think we'll expand on these questions as well, so I won't talk too long about them. So um, experimental, experimental design, I alluded to the fact that Borg of 8 out of 10, we don't know if it's the same thing for men and women. Statistical approach we could have a whole meeting around statistical approaches to get at the question of how men and are men and women different? Is an over the best approach always, all the time? Are classical statistical approaches always the best ones? Is there a need to develop new ones to get at that, that question? I think a lot needs to be done in these areas. 
So last slide, conclusions and recommendations. I think I'll go as far as to say that there are sex gender differences in work-related MSD statistics, as well as most likely in the underlying mechanisms. I won't give up on the idea that it's important to look at motor control biology, the sex aspects that could underlie uh, these differences. Um, yeah, uh, for many reasons, it would be a mistake, I think, to ignore sex and gender in our research design. So this is a plea, or this is a word of encouragement to those of you who are interested to do this kind of research, but maybe you're not sure if it's worth it, if you should do it, or how you should do it. So what are the dangers if you don't consider men and women in your research designs? Well, first is a big one, and I think it's going to speak to a lot of people. You run the chance of no statistical results, purely due to a potential bimodal distribution in your data. Okay, so if you only care about the average values in your data sets and you have some proportion of men, some proportion of women, and if your measurement is bimodal, right away you're shooting yourself in the foot. So I argue that for purely statistical purposes, it's important. Um, you miss the chance of testing different explanatory models according to gender and therefore reaching a better general understanding of injury mechanisms. I think indirectly by asking the question, are men and women different in their mechanisms, there's no way around the fact that it helps to understand the injury mechanisms generally speaking. Okay, so I think it's, it's a good way to, to, to get a better understanding of injury mechanisms. Um, so I'm trying to speak to different kinds of people here. Point number three, the, work, the working world is changing or may change. You might want to study only women because only women do this kind of work now or only men because only men do this kind of work now. And I'll pick the example of my colleague uh, André Plamondon in Quebec. Uh, more women now are involved in manual material handling. Okay, so I think we have to be open to the fact that in our world of MSD, prevention in the workplace, we have to address the possibility that uh, the results will be relevant to men and women, and therefore we should include them in our research designs. How should we do this, though? So I think I, I've convinced everybody that we should be doing this, taking sex and gender into account. This is one example, one model of a stepwise approach um, to, uh, to take sex and gender into account as widely as possible in the uh, research design on occupational health, on, on MSD uh, production. And it's inspired by a lot of people who have been inspired by a lot of people before and now who are inspiring me. So I, I just lit, listed some of these people down here. So uh, Kevin Sogard, uh, she was uh, kind enough to give me this slide, but uh, we all want to recognize the work of Karen Messing and, uh, and uh, and uh, her colleagues in, in this, uh, also Kil Kilbom as well. So really this is just a stepwise, I would say kind of detective work approach. Starting from the starting points as far as you can in what could affect the injury mechanisms and right away asking yourself, uh, society education, uh, are there different jobs? Yes or no? Does the job assignments uh, change or differ between men and women? Work, workplace levels, do men and women perform different tasks in the workplace and does their exposure change? Is it different for men and women? Individual level, do they experience different loads? Do they uh, respond the same way? And does their behavior differ? Okay, so here we're going from society to the actual behavior and at the end back to is there a different treatment? Because that's another uh, important element of, of staying injured or returning to work at some point. Uh, last slide, I want to uh, acknowledge the, uh, this, the really good work. Uh, for those of you who are not sure how, again, how to go about, uh, I, I don't want to make a mistake, but I'm interested in looking at sex and gender. How can I get some information or some training? Uh, the CIHR Institute for Gender and Health has been developing training modules, um, and they're available online. And I know that the Americans are quite jealous that, that we have these training modules. Uh, so, so I think it, it's a really good place to start for someone starting to consider uh, sex and gender in their research. 
And I want to thank uh, my uh, co-chairs and my chair colleagues. We have this wonderful program uh, of uh, CIHR chairholders. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's eight of us, nine, nine with me. And uh, we meet every year and we talk about uh, what's happened in the last year uh, in our research. And it's wonderful. It's a wonderful experience. I want to thank uh, IGH and CIHR for that. I have the picture of the person who initiated this, uh, Dr. Joy Johnson, and now the director of IGH is Kara Tenenbaum. And of course, I want to acknowledge the Quebec IRSST. And uh, lastly, I want to invite all of you to next year, uh, the OSSD meeting, so the Organization for the Study of Sex Differences in Montreal. It's going to be a great time to be in Montreal, the 375th anniversary of Montreal. And I'll be co-chairing this meeting uh, with uh, my colleague Jeff Mogul. And that's it, I want to thank uh, everybody for their support, the participants, the colleagues all over the world who inspire me. Uh, I missed, of course, some of them, but I included a lot who are here in this room. And uh, I want to thank the students and a special thanks to Kim Emery, my research assistant. And I'll take any questions that you might have. Thank you. No, no, no critical comments here. Thanks, Julie, for a very nice presentation. Yes, you just body blocked somebody else, but uh, <laughs> th there's time for everybody, oh, so that's okay. No, no, no. Well, you fight it out. Okay. Men versus women. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's when, when you start your gender structures, right? Because as a man, I should leave the women the first place. That's right? true. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah. Oh, please. Okay. Anyway, uh, thanks again for a nice presentation. I would like to continue on your suggestions of what to do in the future yep. because uh, I'm just fine with sort of trying to answer the questions you pose, which, is essential, which are essential about uh, uh, whether there is a difference here mm -hmm. and what are the immediate explanations to that. But say now that we find that one very likely mechanism for uh, uh, unequal disorder prevalences is that males and females have different tasks. Then comes the next question, why? <laughs> and I think we, have, we need to build together this kind of, say, epi, uh, bio, uh, physiological research with true gender research that can help us answering the why questions. Mm -hmm. What is true gender research? Well, think? a genus, genus uh, theory related research that can answer us why is it so that the girls end up in the mm. cashiers in the supermarket mm. while the boys end up in the stock in the supermarket. Okay, so we're talking more the cultural yeah, kind indeed. Of predisposition. Before right? we understand that, we won't really be able to use the knowledge we get from the epi and physiology studies. Yeah, no, t t completely. Point very well taken. Um, I think it's interesting. I don't know. I'm open to any suggestion on how to best go about with that. Uh, I think this is the right place to have this discussion because we are all interested in MSD, but we come at it from biology to intervention and prevention, so uh, the shareholders program is also a good way to do that. But in terms of having a process to do that, I think it's quite difficult, but I think it's important, definitely. I think maybe one way to, uh, that, that I haven't seen anywhere but that could be a good kind of door into this question would be to look at, compare different cultures and maybe different 50 years ago, 100 years ago, what, you know, what, what, what did we know about these things and, and see how the culture changes would affect uh, these, these observations. But uh, I'm not the right person by myself definitely to ask this. So, yeah. Oh, yes. Hi, Julie. Very nice. Um, Mary Barb, Temple University. Um, I was just quickly back there like looking up all these papers on sexual dimorphism in the brain because I hadn't actually investigated that before. Um, it was stimulated by your talk here. And um, I just found one with um, a meta-analysis that just published in 2015 that said that women had differences in their hippocampus, for example, yep. which would mm -hmm. be the spatial differences. Um, and then there was one that was interesting based on that comment that another paper that 
there's a change in women over time. Like if you look at young women, there was mm -hmm. like a large parietal lobe and large surface, but over time, there's a loss of that larger surface mass, which could very well be driven by the learning hypothesis of what we do in our jobs, that everything shrinks back down. But my question is, did you, have you ever seen any papers on like, you suggested the sympathetic changes on any of like the muscarinic receptor alterations in muscles? Or is this just, do you, I, I didn't look for those. Not in my circle of, of uh, interest or search, or um, maybe there's one or two people in the room who, who would, but I have not come across that. Uh, the hippocampal uh, results, I have uh, seen them. Um, I, yeah, so I think it's that, that in itself is, is uh, such a, an important but big uh, research area that uh, I, I decided to just really briefly touch on it. Um, on your point, though, of it could be because of what people do, um, that's, that's where it, it would be really interesting to argue with, uh, with uh, different points of view. Could also be the aging mechanism that is different between uh, between men and women. Could be the exercise patterns. It could be a lot of different things. That uh, yeah, yeah. For Thank sure. you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hello. Hi. I'm Nieves Serratos from Mexico. Thank you very much for this marvelous, excellent uh, approach. Now, right now in Mexico, we are uh, trying to set up our own regulations on ergonomic risks at work, looking at uh, repetitive motion, at forceful exertions, at uh, postures. Question is, should we be looking into a gents and a ladies department? I mean, should we, should we be thinking of setting up regulations differentiated for women and for men at work? Is there enough knowledge right now to do that? Oh, I was afraid someone was going to ask me this question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll be cautious and say that, in my opinion, we are not certain enough, and I don't know that it would be a good idea to be that certain enough to have different guidelines that would be taken up for years in different places that would have serious consequences on equality, on health, on, on different aspects. Um, but I still think we need to talk about these research results in the right way. And I'm uh, reaching out to the ergonomists out there. And what I would hope is that even if we show some, some gender differences in patterns and postures and fatigue, that the ergonomists could use these results and find ways to implement these differences to provide the same opportunities for men and women in workplaces. There must be ways to change the, 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 the job or we have to be creative, I think. So to use the results, but in a way that respects and that gives equal opportunity to, to everybody. Yeah. Thank you very much. And that means we must work real hard on that issue. Yeah, Thank to you. be cautious, but yeah, keep at it. Bernard Martin from the University of Michigan. <clears throat> In your uh, representation of this variability for the shoulder movement, could it be interpreted as a, a gender issue rather than a sex issue? In fact, uh, it could be viewed that the male are probably more prone or less prone to listen to instruction or apply instruction properly. <laughs> uh, uh... Interpretation of... Uh, the rigidity of the posture, male versus female. Okay. That this variability may be due to, well, I can cheat a little okay. bit. Okay. <laughs> so if, if you're talking about this on a general level, I'm open to, to, to considering that interpretation of instructions in general, but I will say for our experiment though, um, the instructions were the same and the result or the performance in terms of maintaining the beat and not making any errors touching the targets. So really the instructions and the results with respect to the instructions were the same. So it was in the, in the, in the, um, in the freedom or in the room to accomplish the task differently that, that there were differences. But um, 
you know, when we said repeat the task uh, at a normal, comfortable rhythm until, until we tell you to stop and follow the beats, um, maybe women would have picked up some words more than others, men would have picked up some words more than others. It, that's a possibility. Well, I don't know. That's could interesting, be though. It's an societal yeah. issue as well, that following orders, not following orders. Uh, yeah. I don't but, know. But they didn't know that uh, yeah. we just told them to keep moving until, until we would tell them to stop. So, you know, in terms of performance or kind of wish to really accomplish the task to the limit, they didn't know really what that limit was going to be. So, uh, I don't disagree with you. Uh, I think it's something that we can't put aside. But in terms of our task design, uh, that, that's all I can say, basically. I'm not sure. Yeah. In, in terms of uh, sex differences, uh, you mentioned something about proprioception. Yep. And uh, in fact, for some uh, joint, proprioception may be better in male than in female. In other joints, we found that effectively there was no difference in position sense. However, we found very strong differences in movement sense. Is that mm -hmm. We found that females are uh, very symmetric between the two hands, mm -hmm. while males are strongly asymmetric mm -hmm. in terms of uh, movement perception. And the perception of movement velocity mm -hmm. is Same. usually uh, higher in female uh, than in male as yeah. well. Uh, yeah. As far as I know, the, the literature on proprioception is all, is, is yeah. converges to that, changes more or less depending on the sense, the modality, but yeah, it's pretty clear. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Julia, for a really nice talk and all your work and uh, contribution to this field, really great. Um, I would like to have your opinion on two things. The first of all is um, how much of these gender differences in pain are contributed by work. Do we know, know enough about, for instance, by having prospective studies on work factors and how it contributes to, to pain? That's the first thing. The other thing is how can we use this type of information to prevent musculoskeletal disorders at the workplaces in a better way? Okay. Uh First question is a little clearer, but unfortunately, uh, I'm not well positioned to answer it. Um, I'm sorry, what was the first question again? <laughs> I just knew that I, I was certain about how to answer it. Um, I, th I think it's lacking good studies where you've done real proper measurements okay. about ergonomics, like social factors at the workplace, and also other social lifestyle factors yeah. and see what is the best predictors for for these gender differences yeah. and how much is contributed by by, by work. the work yeah okay so uh, about the relationship with work um i don't okay so so i know that the work related disorders are, are different the reporting of of, uh, of work related msd is different now, in terms of how clearly people can identify work as the source of their pain, can someone help me with that? Well, um, well what, what I, I mean is, is not if, if to ask the worker if, if they think it's due to work, okay. but it's more about if you are having good measurements of monotonous work, repetitive work, mm -hmm. heavy work, factors, lifestyle factors, mm -hmm. social factors, mm -hmm. and then follow them up for several years and see how much is attributable. Mm -hmm. yeah, These so gender differences in pain, how much is attributable okay, to, so, to work? Yeah, so we know, um, I know of one uh, model of uh, return to work uh, after injury where uh, there is a longitudinal uh, model that predicts what could be important factors and th the, the factors differ between men and women. I don't think that that model includes more of the exposures or the postures or the, the fatiguing or the really what touches on uh, the, the, the kind of research that I do. I don't know of a good model that, that includes uh, all of these aspects. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, second thing yeah. about how to use this at workplaces okay. to, for better prevention. Yeah. So uh, this is where... Um, Again, I want to stay away, uh, the, the, the previous question from the, the Mexican colleague, I want to stay away from saying men should do this, women should do this, and everybody's going to be happy. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I think the key is to uh, understand what's going on and to try to really 
put it all together into a model of work-related musculoskeletal disorders, knowing what we find in women, what we find in men, and where could be some places uh, in the work task where we could prevent uh, these, these kinds of, uh, of uh, results from, from appearing. This is really not clear. So, uh, so for example, if we know that uh, someone with low variability, it happens to be women. So if we have a workplace that's mostly women, and we think that there could be a problematic of neck shoulder disorders, we know from the results that uh, it's important, it could be important to find a way to have more variability in that workplace. I think that that's how the results can be used. So it's results that come from sex gender comparisons that have highlighted variability as an important mechanism and how can we use that to improve the health of men and women. Again, because we want all of this to benefit men and women. But I'm not the ergonomist. How really exactly, precisely, concretely to do that? I think we need creative ways to do that and careful ways to do that. Hi. Um, very nice presentation. I like that a lot. I was very struck by one of the earlier slides where you showed the three distributions. One where the distributions mm -hmm. were quite distinct, one where there was some overlap and one total. Yeah. I'm thinking when we're reporting quantitative results, we're comparing means all the time and whether there's some <coughs> merit to start to think about looking at the overlap mm -hmm. in the distributions as well. Yeah, I, I, that's an important point I was trying to make, is, is I think that's important and we, uh, there's a danger there in, in, uh, in uh, avoiding this overlap question. Um, we have started to work with metrics to, uh, to actually quantify similarities as well as differences. Uh, we have a colleague in the room near, near the microphone who, uh, who has thought of, of uh, statistical ways to do that the best. Um, so. I think it's important and then you get to the multi-dimensional model and then it gets really complicated because for some boxes you will have more or less overlap and other boxes you will have more or less overlap. But you know, big data is just around the corner. Is there a way to actually uh, not give up on, on these possibilities? You know, I, th I think it's worth trying still. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> she won the race that time. <laughs> Good job. I, I get to see Julie on a semi-regular basis. One of the so, shareholders, so Mika. I, I wanted to allow other people the opportunity to, to take advantage of the opportunity to ask you questions. But um, I, I'm, as a non-biomechanist, I'm trying to reconcile your results where um, men were more <coughs> flexible, adaptable, variable, yeah. but fatigue was the same. Yeah. And so I'm trying to reconcile those two findings from your lab result and wondering whether the fatigue then is a gendered concept. I think so. I is think you're what? right on. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> trying to figure, reconcile the, yeah, I would have thought because of the more flexible yeah. variable that fatigue well, would be yeah. different. So maybe my answer was quick. I think you're right on. <clears throat> maybe that's not the whole story though. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because we did see that the trapezius muscles seem to show a, a bigger uh, change with fatigue. So it could be that some body regions in men become more fatigued and then there's a need to find these alternative ways uh, with, with the other possibilities in your motor patterns. So, um, so I, I'm not perfectly ready to say that it's, it's a gendered concept, fatigue and, and pain, but uh, yeah, it could be. <clears throat> Thank you, Julie, for your very nice overview. Um, I have maybe a bit of a more detailed question. I was wondering about this higher variability um, in the man and the higher proprioception in the women. Because variability, you can also explain that, that um, if you have less variability, uh, sorry, if you have less proprioception, you will be more variable in certain tasks. So um, how do you connect those two? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the variability, we didn't measure variability in accuracy. We measured variability in patterns in the repeatability of the motor pattern. Um, so we didn't take that part, what is the variability in the accuracy results, okay? We were looking at the variability of the motor patterns as a way to really uh, sort of address whether the exposure itself on the muscles was different, not, not the outcome in terms of, uh, of, a, of a motor output. <clears throat> um, and then, 
proprioception, uh, so they're more accurate and they're less variable. That works uh, in that case. Yeah. <laughs> it does work in that case, but I mean that the maybe the, the space they use, um, they use the accuracy more in that sense. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Well, okay, so let me just make the, because you're asking me a specific question, I'll, I'll give a kind of like a more specific answer as well. I think the work on variability needs to be expanded. And uh, there is a community in motor control that does work on good variability versus bad variability. Uh, variability of, um, of elemental variables versus of, of, uh, of outcome, of whole body outcome. So there are different kinds of variabilities that, you know, if we speak variability, that's also a topic that can be uh, um, kind of uh, misinterpreted and kind of, you know, carried around with different interpretations. So, yeah. Yeah, and I'm, maybe I also meant, like, did you use both metrics in the same experiments to see how, how those two were linked in, six, in the same individual? So proprioception and variability? No. No, no, because I think that also might give some sort of answer to these, how these, um, you have different factors, but I think the interaction between okay. the factors will um, maybe answer more these type of differences. Sure, sure, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, th thank you, Julie, for a wonderful summary of this complex topic. The, the topic is complex enough from what you presented but what happens when you, um, to the findings of the difference between S and G, when you begin to compare um, different ethnicities, mm -hmm. racial groups, and cultural mm -hmm. backgrounds? Is there, does this persist, the findings you've to told us, or is there much difference between those other factors? Isn't that a good idea? That's a wonderful idea. So I don't, I haven't seen any strong, good studies in my radar to be able to answer that question, but that's such a wonderful idea to, to get at that, uh, at that question. Yeah, so, yeah. <coughs> Nancy St. Ange from Columbia University. Uh, Julie, you talked about the social, uh, cultural, psychosocial aspect of pain and how it can influence how men and women report pain. Uh, what about the tester? What about if the tester is mm. a man or a woman? And I'm mm -hmm. sure if we go back in time a few years, we, we can both remember the time that I helped you with the data collection for your PhD experiments, and you're smiling. <laughs> so there was this young 20-year-old male that we could never get him to say eight on the Borg scale. He was sawing or uh, hammering, I think. So what about if we had been two male testers instead of two female testers? Would that have <clears throat> influenced the results? So maybe you can comment on how we could uh, integrate that or take that into account in our data collections. Yeah, so that's been said, definitely, that uh, there could be an impact. How much, I'm not sure. Um, that's where we get into some, some territories where, um, yeah, I think it could be done. It could be a very simple research paradigm. I've seen actually some studies who have done that change, you know, the, the sex of the subject and the sex of the experimenter due to different com combinations. And, uh, and that's easily verifiable. So I see some people nodding, so it could have been already uh, some clear results on that. So there, there, there is an impact. Uh, now, um, it, it could be important to do that for all the boxes, for, for, yeah, for, for, for the model, for pain especially, I would say. Uh, pain is such, as you said, the psychosocial construct that it would be important. Yeah, so I would say. I'm not saying sure. we should also always have all the boxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, at least for pain. Should, but should we be, but it could be for f fatigue also, but what yeah. I mean is like not necessarily having all the boxes, but how can we organize yep. the experiment? Should we do it such that it's a, a male collecting with a male participant, a female collecting with a female participant, or, mm -hmm. or both a female and a male present? Or a robot, or, or, or some uh, software. Or I mean, it's, hard, like it's a hard one, but yeah, maybe we yeah. should take it into consideration. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that's actually one of the recommendations I had, pick the boxes where there could be an impact uh, of these factors, not all of them, obviously. Uh, but yeah, that's a really good, uh, good point, important point. Thank you. <coughs> Good, good suggestions, thank you. <laughs> Richard Wells, University of Waterloo. Uh, thank you, Julie, for summarizing that. Just thinking in terms, again, of the, the end point in terms of applying this, you've shown that there are differences between men and women and the, the kinds of differences. 
but we know there are differences due to age. Mm -hmm. There's differences due to ethnicity and origins. So if we have to come up with new guidelines for all of these factors, perhaps we're in trouble. And so in terms of applying this, perhaps we need to think more about inclusive design mm -hmm. you know, rather than splitting people up into lots of little pieces in terms of the, its application. And are you saying that it would be up to the worker then to find the, the, the place in the uh, inclusive de design where they would fit? Or how, how would we do that? Um, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of recognizing that uh, an inclusive design would, uh, mm -hmm. would account for many of these differences okay. as well. And as an ergonomist, is that, does that simplify things or complicate things? I will defer to some of my colleagues on that. <laughs> yeah. But, but already, I think if we have, uh, for example, in terms of uh, assessing uh, a manual materials handling situation, we have uh, one tool, such as the, the Nash equation, that is uh, not sensitive to gender mm -hmm. and sex, whereas we have another one, which is uh, the Liberty Mutual Manual Materials Handling tables that do have a a gender effect yeah. and that can have I think some perverse mm -hmm. effects okay yeah yeah so uh, I think that's a really important point uh, I think maybe what about uh, identifying some boundaries or some margins and you know uh, gender uh, ethnicity and, and then uh, maybe there could be some boundaries and the recommendations for for these uh, for these tools I don't know maybe that would be a good idea I don't know. No, I, it's just a, a, yeah. a thought. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Thank you very much. Um, but thank you, Julie. That was really marvelous. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. you.